So I'm a, I'm a research fellow and postdoc in the Borovitz lab over at the um, Research School of Biology. And my background is actually studying army ants. I study complexity theory. But from there, I got into um, environmental monitoring. And so I'm just going to run quickly through a lot of the, the different projects we work on. And I hope you guys will see that there's a lot of, a lot of our unsolved problems currently are really just engineering and software problems, which is why we had John. So um, to start out, you know, the, the reason this matters is because the next hundred years are going to really be a huge, or really a huge deal in, in, in human history. Um, since 1500, we've seen massive biodiversity loss with 30% decline in land mammals and 70% of invertebrates showing greater than 45% declines. 90% of the world's fish stocks are exploited. Um, and there's going to be more than 7 billion people on this planet for the next century at least. So however many people are now is just going to get more and it's going to keep doing that for 100 years. And they're expected to be 11 billion people on the planet by 2100. And to feed all those people, we have to grow more food by 2100 than all the food produced in human history. And to put that in context, if you've ever seen those graphs of uh, food production going up, you know, they, they kind of go up like this. We need to basically increase our production 40% over that historic level every year between now and 2050. To, to meet food demands. And we have to do that in the face of all the climate change impacts we're going to have. So climate's going to warm by 4 to 6 C by 2100. And it's been warming so much that no one under the age of 24 has lived in a year when the Earth was cooler than it has been in the last 2,000 years. That's my favorite crazy statistic of every reason. And there, there are a lot of environmental impacts. And for example, in Australia, something like half of eucalyptus species will be out of their native ranges by 2100. So that means that the temperatures that these trees are experiencing are going to be temperatures that they've just never experienced before. And so there's this huge shift uh, by 2100, something like 800 kilometers, like like uh, Sydney will have the climate of Brisbane, more or less, by, by 2100. And so if you think of both human impacts and plant impacts, a plant that's been living for 200 years in a spot, and suddenly it's living 800 kilometers north of there, it, that, that has a lot of major impacts. Sea levels are going to rise, and if you think of all the crazy weather we had with the 20 meter waves a few weeks ago, the prediction is we'll get events like that every few days instead of every few years. That's from a CSRO uh, report that's kind of scary to me. So if you read a lot of sci-fi, people talk about terraforming planets, and you know I think currently what we're doing is we're, we're un-terraforming the Earth, right? So the idea of terraforming <laughs> things is making a livable habitat, and, and we're doing that at a really exceptional rate. Um, and what I think we need to do is start to think about how we really actively engineer environments and actively start trying to shift our, ourselves to a sustainability and in the context of both building, you know, reforesting and, and rebuilding environments, how, how we actively manage things in a, in a much more conscious and, and complex way than we've done in the past. Because we need to feed 7 billion people the next hundred years. So, so in, in less sci-fi terms, the, the grand challenge of this century, I think, is to stay, manage, and create ecosystems that can optimize the benefit to other living things, provide sustainable ecosystem services, that's all the, you know, food and air and water and sunlight for humans, and do this in the, the face of overpopulation, resource scarcity, climate change, and all the other major, major negative human impacts that we're experiencing. And because of this, I think we really no longer have the luxury of trusting low-resolution ecological models. And, and what I mean by that is that because technology has been limit, the limiting factor in, in ecosystem research for so long, the current resolution of field ecology is very limited. You have low spatial and time resolution data. You know, you have a field site where you put a temperature sensor and a couple other things, and that's your data set. Like the National Arboretum, their, their weather station was at the airport until we put one in. You know, so that, that's the resolution of data you're collecting, right? And if you've ever been out there at the airport, they're, they're kind of different climates. You know, sampling is often somebody goes out and sits under a tree in a forest and takes some notes. Um, and so observations are not interoperable. There's little data sharing. It's often proprietary. So if I have a field site here and somebody wants to reproduce my work, typically they go develop a field site somewhere else, develop all their own techniques, try to do all their own measurements, and then we fight about our outcomes. And you can see that um, this makes it really hard to, to verify results and repeat experiments because they're with different tools at different sites by different observers. 
And because of this low resolution data, the paradigm for sample resolution is usually forest or field. It's not tree or plant. And you certainly can do a lot looking at what a, a forest is doing, but it, it's not the same as measuring every leaf on every tree. And finally, very little data from the last century is available for use because there hasn't been any data management. We haven't had you know, cloud computing and all this other stuff. So my research focus is really on how we can use new technology to capture what's going on in the environment at high resolution and quantify it and provide it to scientists and the public so they can use it. And we do this in two ways. We do it in the lab and we study phenotypes, which are just a big word for plant behavior, and genomics, so the whole genomes of plants. And this field is called phenomics, phenotype and genomics. And this lets us identify the genetic basis of plant growth and development in relation to their environment. And then the field I'm interested in, how do we do really high resolution monitoring of ecosystems? And because my work is largely monitoring, you know, really what I'm trying to do is how do you continuously measure stuff, measure pixels, measure plants at high resolution and low cost? So phenomics matters because it helps us maximize carrying capacity. We can improve crop yields and land use efficiency when we understand the genetics of how plants interact with their environments better. We can maintain and restore ecosystem services but to do this, we need really advanced environmental monitoring and high accuracy ecosystem models. And this also will help us um, maintain and restore natural areas of biodiversity to account for the significant projected climate change impacts. And so you can do things like when you're planting crops, you know, in the US basically the crops fail every year for 10 years and then on the 11th year they get a huge boom. And in the off years, they get paid for by tax dollars to you know, make for their crop insurance, and that's the paradigm for growing things. It's much better to plant a seed set that's based on your predicted environmental model for the coming year, and maybe you only get 60% yield every year, but you get that every year, and so your five-year average, your 10-year average is 60% rather than 10%, you 10%, know, 10%, 10%, 110%. And that's just a much better way to create food stability in the face of changing climates. When you want to replant a forest, the problem now is if you go and plant a forest and you put a bunch of seeds, you know, you source your seeds from nearby, you plant them, a hundred years from now those trees are living somewhere that those seeds were not evolved to live. And so there's this concept of adaptive, um, adaptive migration where we can actually help trees migrate to, to the climate they'll be living in a hundred years from now. And we can, we can plant a seed set where some trees will do really well now but not as well later. And some trees can maybe barely hang on now, but when it gets really hot and dry, those will be the trees whose, whose genotype is best suited for that environment. And finally, you know, the thing that people who really like, you know, who are worried about conservation don't want to think about is that there's a fixed amount of money for conservation, and there's a fixed amount of land we're going to put aside, and there's a fixed amount of effort that people are going to spend to preserve things. And so by understanding the genetics of things on the landscape and which, which environments are going to be most brittle, you know, and most most likely to burn or most likely to not survive, it helps us understand where we can spend limited conservation dollars. <clears throat> so the, the main thing that informs our work is this, this triangle of how genotype, your genes and the environment, go to measure phenotypes. So you know everyone, I mean so generate phenotypes. So you know, everyone's familiar with height, right? Like if you get poor, you're, you're going to have some sort of average height in the middle, but if you get poor nutrition in your life, you're going to be shorter than that, and if you're fed really well, you'll be taller. And there are all these graphs of, you know, people changing over time as they get higher nutrition. So the phenotype is something that comes out of your genetics, you know, how high, how high, how tall you could actually be, and your environment, how much food you got. And this is true for everything. And um, the degree to which we can measure these things is really the degree to which, you know, if you go look at a forest and all the crazy complex stuff that's happening there, that emerges out of this really dynamic interaction between the genes of all the populations there and the environment that they experience over long periods of time. So you can see there's a lot of data in there that's hard to measure, but it's really important. So what we do in the lab is we try and measure stuff more precisely in the field, and in the lab we try and make more natural lab conditions. So the field is, um, you know, it's the real world, which means it's really variable. You can see the crazy lighting here. You can see the camera drops out right when fall happens. You know, so one, one problem is you can monitor for an entire year, and right when fall happens, your camera dies, and you lose the data, the only useful data point in the whole data set. Um, but in the field, we can measure things with uh, low complexity, but it's actually a realistic environment. Whereas in the lab, we have, you know, highly controlled 
We have highly controlled growth conditions, but very low realism. So if you look at the real world, this is what light looks like on a normal day for a plant. And if you look at what a normal growth chamber is, this is what, what the light is like. And this is like, you know, 99% of all plant research is done in environments like this one so down here. that light on the real world, right? Yeah. Uh, explain it to me. So it's luminance on the lumens on the left, is it? Um, um, it's what's called PAR, photosynthetically active radiation. And I right. presume this is a, a cloudy day. So, right. You know, so the little shady. the little blocks are clouds going right. by. Right. So yeah, it, it starts out really sunny. A couple of clouds go over. The clouds come and go and come right. and go and come and go. Or you can imagine if a plant is at the edge of a forest, or there's some other shade yeah, on it, yeah. and the wind is blowing a lot, it's yeah. going to have a lot of variation based on how much. And so is that just the 12 hours of daylight? It's 8 a.m. till 6 a.m. Yeah. Something yeah something. So yeah, so it actually sort of would have a dark to and then do that, right? Yeah. 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 And so that would go down and then come back. Over. And the, the synthetic <coughs> growth chamber is way, way less powerful, right? Is that normal? Um, it really depends on your plant, so you can kind of dial that in. And mm -hmm. if you it brighter you can do it so but that's I mean typically in the growth chamber you have day length and brightness and that's it the lights come on in the morning and they go off at night yeah um, and so I think it's kind of like the white lab mouse you know like we've done tons of great medicine on the white mouse but it's barely even an animal anymore right it's this weird genetic thing um, and, and plants are the same way like we we throw them in chambers we claim it's the real world and we all know it isn't but if you do anything else it's really hard to measure it and so what we've been developing is this idea where you can take the you take the weather out of the environmental signal and you can mimic you know regional growing conditions around the world. So we have these um, these multispectral LEDs here, and um, we have software that lets us dial in growing regions anywhere in the world we want at any time of the season. And you can have cold mornings and warm nights. You can have longer and shorter days. You can have you know fall going into winter, spring spring going into summer. And so it lets us have much more realistic growing conditions. You can also push things by climate change, so you can add a degree and a half or something. And you can grow, since we have a bunch of these chambers, you can grow one in, you know, you can grow one in inland conditions, and you can grow the same set of plants that goes those so conditions. in, along with the light, you also have air conditioning through the chamber, do you? you uh, actually we change have, the we have a temperature that we can change at one minute intervals. The humidity, I think we can bring it down, but we can't put it up. Right. Um, so that that responds on a slower thing. We don't do too much with humidity except keep it from getting really high. Right. Uh, but basically but the, temperature the software you can basically set, right? The software we set at every, you know, whatever time interval we have, we set the lights and the temperature. Okay. And so it's kind of cool if you go in there, you see, you know, in the evening you see sunset. If you come in the morning it's cold and then you can feel it warm up yeah. as you go by. Um, but the idea is that, you know, this, this is a more this is a more realistic environment compared to the real compared to regular growth chambers. And what you can also do is if you have a field site, once you've started doing trials on plants in here, you can actually take the same plants from the field and grow them in your chamber and actually have the live weather data come in from the field and take the weather part out, you know, the rain and wind and clouds, but keep in the temperature and humidity setting. So you can you can start doing things where you're you're much more closely mimicking what, what's going on in the field. Uh, let's see, I think I covered most of this. And, and the real idea is you expose these cryptic phenotypes. So a lot of plants, like if you grow them in normal growth chambers, they look the same. But if you give one of them fluctuating light, or you give one of them spring or fall conditions, you get these completely different behaviors. And there's genes associated with that that you would just never see if you're growing them in a normal growth chamber. Um, let's see. Yeah, and, and so the other thing we do is we genotype every single plant. So every single plant here, we have the full genome sequence of the plant. What that allows us to do is match any environmental measurement we've measured with, with um, well, sorry, any phenotype of measurement with um, variation in the genome. And the upshot of that is we have seven of these chambers with 320 plants in each chamber, and that means that we're getting, we're trying to get data from 120,000 plot images a day. And that part of the pipeline, that what you capture the image and how you turn that into numeric data, is what John was working on in our lab. And the goal for us is, you know, high throughput phenotyping for the masses. So there's lots of really, you can spend a couple million dollars and get really nice systems to do this stuff. What we want is a completely off the shelf, do it yourself. You buy some hardware, you wear it together with a Raspberry Pi, you hit go. The data goes off to the cloud and gets processed on the supercomputer here and you get your numbers back without having to do any of this super technical stuff that you had to do in the past. Um, so moving on to field ecology. In 
in genetics, there's been this big change where it used so, to take... So, yeah. Sorry to be paying, jump sure. back. So you just jumped through a couple of the technology slides there, yes. so here and, and those two. Yeah. Um, will we come back to those later? Because of course this is, those two slides are probably the... <laughs> I mean, you went by them pretty quick and everybody's sitting here going, oh, what cameras are those? You know? Jeez, I, I can go into You're not using detail. a C-Lens there, are you? What are you using the Raspberry Pi? What are you running on that? Anyway, sorry. Um, so we, yeah, we have, we have Python code now that the... <coughs> The Raspberry Pis can, I think they can control a lot of DSLRs. We've only plugged two into each just camera. Just by the way, sorry. Um, so they run two DSLRs. Yeah. That's actually a really sweet set setup. It, it creates its own Tor network, so we can just log in. So we have all these Pis running the chambers. We can just log in, yep. change the settings on all of them. It's all done through Python code. There's a nice web interface where it just on the fly updates and tells us the status of all the cameras, right, okay. which is really important because otherwise i got to go in here every morning and turn on every one of the... 14 cameras and check all the stuff yeah. to see if they're yeah. capturing, and then I gotta go to the, you know, so the, I gotta go to the server and actually open up each folder and see if the things yeah, are okay. there. So the Raspberry Pi is running a what a, a, a Linux. Yeah, the Raspberry Pi is running a Linux Python code uh, with, with Python G, running into this G -Lin G -Lin GUI, GUI interface. Okay. Yeah. And so effectively, all it's doing is image capture, right? So it's got a driver for the cameras. Yeah, it captures and it JPEGs captures, and RAW and it pushes them to our server. Pushes them on the server. Then we have software on the server that takes those, you know, they come in with the image underscore whatever yep. numbers on yeah. there, reads the XF data and converts it into our standardized naming format. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one of the things that we've really been trying to do is standardize everything, right? Because okay, and that's, you and have that's, everything. If you jump back one, so then you add the the um, the tag, the top right hand corner tag thing in the computer, right? So you get an image in. Yeah. And then this is done in the this is what you've already got this pipeline, this image processing pipeline. So you add in the, the, the tag in the top right, and then you do some stuff. Yeah. So Signation actually, um, go back a bit. <clears throat> this is what each each image looks like when it comes in. Oh, okay. We've actually replaced the QR codes with just text because I I thought it was actually probably easier to read text and. And they're actually physical, are they, or are they something? That yeah, they're. Um, these are so as you probably know, one of the real challenges with time lapse is keeping stuff from moving around. Yeah. And these get taken out and moved around a lot and put back in. Uh, so we have the problem that when you take it out, it moves the plants, as yeah. well as often they'll put the tray in upside down or in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. So the, the current version says tray number one in huge letters. I'm trying to make it totally a deeper. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, in the long run, the camera will be detecting that and seeing if it stops saying tray number one, we know there's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how, so big is, how big is tray number one? They're uh, about that big. Yeah, but in this image? So this this is um, about two meters by a meter and a half. Okay, so each one of those plants is a separate tray, basically. No, the, each tray holds, sorry, each whole tray holds uh, 20, 20 plants. Yeah. So it's 168 trays. Yep, okay. These are, I got them laser cut over at the art department, so it's this frame with the pot sitting in, and it's nice because once you've detected the tray, everything else is in the exact same position. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> the stuff that Chong d developed was the Really, so right now it, it detects the, the color checker, mm -hmm. color corrects the whole thing, fixes the brightness problems, and distorts it, and then detects all the pots and segments it down. So we have a, uh, a file that just gives us pot location for everything in the image. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to scale it so that as long as you have a color checker and some pots, it'll just work. So you know, not everybody grows things on this scale out, but most common is people have just like one tray, right? Yeah, and they want to put a camera on it, and if they put a color checker in it, I want. Yeah. 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 Kind of okay. So then essentially, there's one of the QR codes for every tray. If you physically move a tray, you move the QR code. Yeah. And it'll come back, and then you know from the QR code where the tray is. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah. So then it goes through the color corrected ones. You can see how much better it works. And then it gets segmented, and then you know basically we measure. We output CSV files that have for every time point and every plant in the chamber everything we can measure, which right now is area and color, yeah. uh, smallest to closest circle, just the usual metrics. And that's an RGB image, right? Yeah, so you, RGB. you're sort of getting, it's not hyperspectral, right? You're just getting the RGB. No, and it's fine. we're going to, I'm actually going to be, it's kind of nice because we can control the bandwidth on the camera yeah. and on the lights. We can get actually an NIR sensitive cameras, but because they're not getting near infrared light, it's still a nice RGB image. Mm -hmm. And then at night, we can turn on the infrared on the same camera and we're just getting that, so I think we're going to be able to image 24 hours a day um, just by using the modified DSLRs that have their 
their pass filter taken out. Right. Yeah. So that's that's the next step because if you watch the time lapse of these, there's this jump because they grow about four or five millimeters every night. Yeah, they and actually grow really mostly at night, don't they? In the cold. They grow a lot. Yeah, yeah and um, <clears throat> for leaf tracking and whatnot, it'd be a lot easier to have twenty four hour a day. Yeah. Imaging. Yeah. Um, so that's you know basically many, we want to get everything working and then we can we'll start adding. So in that bottom right hand pix, uh, pic image, so how many? How, yeah, that one. How many pixels are there? I think they're 220, 230 per pot. It's not that high resolution. Um, 220 per pot, so something yeah. like 20 by 40 pixels. Uh, is that right? No, it's even wrong. 20 by 10 pixels for a pot? No, sorry, it's two, 200 on a side. So 400. It's, okay, it's, yeah, 200 it's by like 400. It's a half megapixel image. Yeah. Okay. yeah it's, it's, so a, it's 18 one, megapixels divided by 160, basically. Yeah. Minus so one, one pot would be like 50 pixels high and maybe 50 pixels long. But it's, it's like 50 by 50 pixels per pot. I think it's 200 by 200. But, but that's including all the extra bits. So once you get down to the point, you're probably down that range. I think this is 200 by 200 pixels. Okay. Like that. And then, so there's this whole problem. Like, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to resort, so you have the 160 pick plants, or and you have them in different growth conditions, and you want to take them all and show them together, there's a visualization problem of whether or not you crop everything down to you know your 300, your time series of 300 little tiny squares, mm -hmm. or you put this in net CDF and pull the pixels out or something else. Like how you actually grab all that data and visualize it on the fly is, is quite a challenge. Yep. And. Um, Right. So there's a lot of space there for us to talk. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of space, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I only had a morning to put this together, so it's going to be more science slides and computer <laughs> science, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, That's cool. Yeah. But, you know, so that, as, back to me complaining about ecology being low resolution, th that was also the problem in genetics. But what happened in genetics is it used to take, you know, your whole PhD to, to clone one gene. And now you just do that like students are doing thousands for their, their honors projects. So, um, what's happened is this massive influx of technology has taken the cost of, of the human genome from you know two and a half billion dollars for the first one to like now we just bought these sequencing machines on eBay right for like nine hundred dollars a piece and we can get whole genomes for you know ten to fifty bucks in a couple weeks and so you've gone from this this thing where you just try to get one gene to you can get ten thousand genomes really easily at low cost and and that's completely transformed how people do genetics. And because of that, we've gone from genetics studying genes to genomics to now phenomics where you just, you know, you can sequence every plant in your entire research. And so we're getting pretty high, high resolution stuff at the lab. So we have precise environmental controls. The, the people that are doing the really state-of-the-art systems have 3D time-lapse models with every plant growing, you know, in each pixel and in, in from hyperspectral cameras mapped in 3D and the genome sequence. And then these automated bioinformatics pipelines for extracting all of the data about, about what the plants are doing and comparing with genetics. But I would argue that ecosystems, you know, once we leave our growth chambers, those are way more complex than what you have in a growth chamber, the ecosystem is. And so we need even higher resolution capacity than we do. And, and when you say this to ecology people, they sort of go, oh my god, you know, how would we do this? But I don't think we have the luxury of saying, well, it's too complex, we can't measure it. Like, that's what we need to do. We need measuring this stuff on forests out in the middle of nowhere, you know, in real time. And, um, okay, so, yeah. Because, you know, this, this is much more what the world looks like than that. And there's a phrase in science, ridiculogram, I don't know if you guys said the same thing, which is people start doing these complex things and they make this graph that's got, like, every protein interaction that makes no sense, but it looks impressive. Which brings up the other problem is that like once you actually are measuring this instead of this, it's really hard to visualize in a meaningful way what's going on. And that's another area that really needs some, some smart UI design and computer science people to think about is when you have this multi-dimensional data, how do you render it in a form that the human brain can make sense of? Um, you know, and I think about it in, our, in the lab, is, like in the field, how do we measure everything all the time? You know, how do we go from this thing where you have stand age in years, you know, this is like how old is your tree and how much biomass there is in your whole forest, to this sort of model where we have this, you know, three-dimensional live model of a tree where we're tracking, if, if not every leaf, at least every tree in a lot of ways. And luckily, technology is on our side. You guys all know this more than, more than most biologists do. But, you know, for example, 30 years ago, the first spatial had one megabyte of RAM, right, because that was what NASA could afford to put in their spaceship. 
you know, and uh, the 4G bandwidth, so the MODA satellite, which is sort of a low resolution satellite that a lot of people use for research, that's got the same same bandwidth that you have in your phone for downloading this this uh, 256 meter on the side pixel map of the entire world. You know, each, each pixel is 256 meters, I think. And 20 years ago, you know, there was no web Wi-Fi anything. And so this is just changing faster and faster. Facebook is 10 years old, and they already have um, 1.3 billion active monthly users, which is more people than anyone but China. And um, if you just think of, you know, like the trajectory is up towards like technology solving all our problems in a lot of ways. And in terms of monitoring, you know, 1.8 billion images are uploaded by, from social media every day. And you compare this to the way people are monitoring for us now. They take an IP camera that's got a crappy three megapixel image and they put it up on a tower and they take a picture every hour of a whole forest. And then they average that down to a region of interest and they get like the red, green, and blue values. And that, that is the resolution of how we monitor ecosystems right now. And that's considered super high tech by most people. And yet there's like two billion pictures of the world that are geolocated where you know the camera parameters being taken every day by regular people. So, the question is, how do we scale up to start using data like that? And self-driving cars, I mean, I don't know what the real statistics are, but some people think that, you know, half or three quarters of self-driving cars will be, of cars will be self-driving by the middle of the century. And so all of those cars are just driving down the highway, scanning and modeling the environment for us. And so there's starting to be these data sets that are really dense and interesting. I threw this in because it's a great, you should look it up sometime, the number of methods that we now have on our phones. And basically, you know, be, be, with bandwidth and supercomputers, we, we've got this amazing ability to, to, to do stuff um, just from our phones and our pockets and our new technology. All right, so we're trying to implement this out at the National Arboretum. Um, this is our sample field site right now. We got an ANU major equipment grant in 2014, um, and it was a collaboration with some folks at the Fenner School. And, you know, within the next 10 years, I think we're going to have a whole bunch of stuff that we can measure similar to what we can do in labs. So we'll get automated time series um, daily or weekly UAV scans, and we can measure RGB, hyperspectral, and thermal. And this can give us three-dimensional models of every tree on the site. We can use super high resolution cameras, and I'll dig into this technology in a bit, to um, track phenology changes in every tree or plant. There's new laser scanning technologies coming online that gives us really high res um, scans of the world. Have you guys seen the Dweller of the Zebedee stuff? Yes. I'll show some of that later. Um, no, they're both from, oh, actually, I don't know where Zebedee's from. Maybe it's from Disney. Cicero. 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 Okay, yeah. yeah. We're getting on over at the Fenner School. And then these microclimate mesh networks that let us measure the environmental part of that equation on um, all sides. And so when you think back to that phenotype environment and genetics, like we're able to sequence, we're going to be able to sequence every tree, we're going to be able to measure the environment. You know, these sensors cost a thousand bucks now, but they're going to be a few hundred bucks soon. And we're going to be able to measure in high resolution what the plants are actually doing. Um, and so the National Arboretum site is really great because it's close by. You know, the last field site I worked at was five hours away, so it basically took like four days to go do anything and come back. And here you can just grab a car, run out there, and come back. So it's really nice to, for prototyping things. There are a lot of institutions nearby, and it's a brand new forest, right? So if you go out there now, it's got see trees like this, but those are going to grow up into 50, 100 year old trees, and we're going to have these forests that we've measured since birth. Um, and it's a really great site for testing these kind of next gen monitoring systems before we move them onto more remote places where we can't have a break. Um, and yeah, we have this, this Wi Fi thing here just points right back to the Cockroft building and we got really fast internet, so it's really handy. So we have a, a, a 20 node wireless mesh network out there um, that measures temperature, humidity, sunlight, soil, and moisture, and then, um, that's supposed to say dendrometers. Micrometer resolution dendrometers, like so tree growth data. Now is both, a lot of this stuff seems possible, but we can't quite do it yet because the technology is not mature. And then once we have all the data, we don't know what to do with it. Um, and really the problem, you know, it used to be you could measure something with a thermometer, and that was your data point. But now the samples, like the GigaVision camera, we shoot 200 pictures an hour. We stitch that into 5,000 tiled images per parameter per hour. You have to align those time series against each other and over time through all the hardware failures and upgrades and camera movement. 
and then you need to figure out how to visualize your 22 million images over the internet so other people can see it. And even once you've done that, all you've done is show people that you've collected a lot of data, you haven't actually analyzed it in any kind of meaningful way. And so there's this huge computer vision problem about all the stuff I was showing of how you detect that time series and start doing meaningful things that turn that into usable data that hopefully gives you results. And this is a huge shift in science. You know, it used to be you could just measure something and that was your stuff. You do some analysis and you get results. And now we have this, this whole pipeline of work and years of research and engineering it takes just to get to an actual data sample before you can do something with it. Um, so one, I think a lot about how to visualize data and one thing is um, it seems like we need a new paradigm for how we think about all this data and so what we're working on is building a, a 3D model of the arboretum and using that to visualize the data on top of the, the 3D models of the trees because you know humans are really well tuned to understand things if you put it if you put the information in a way that brains can take in and you know what the old school naturalists did is they went and sat out in the forest and they just looked around at stuff and kind of thought about it and hung out a long time and you know that was how they figured out how things work and it was not very quantitative but they were using their intuition and that was a valuable thing and what i think we can do now is we can we can take the super high resolution data that we have and we can merge it with the way in which people start to get intuition about things. So you can go into a virtual forest and you can see the trees, but then you can start pulling up quantitative data. You can do you know, statistics and research on it on the fly, but you're not stuck with trying to figure out a way to visualize this data. Like, like the first time we got back the time series data on all the plants, I sent off the statistician and he sent me back a 300 page PDF of individual graphs of what every plant was doing at every time point for, you know, 900 plants. But that's, that's how people are used to handling data, right? And, and it's not actually easy to think of how you would visualize it otherwise. And so what, the, what this project is doing is I think it's a good way to start thinking about new ways we can do it. And so one thing you can do is you can take that LiDAR data and you can start, you can throw it into Houdini, which is a, a 3D um, gaming modeling engine they use for, for movies and whatnot. And you can start building these really beautiful uh, models and what you can also do is you can start attaching metrics to it so you know once you have a model like this you can say color code me the trees by the rate of growth and then color code the ground by how much soil moisture is different over here color code the air by the change in temperature over time by the wind patterns and so you're looking at a forest but you're seeing overlaid on it all of the all of the data is geospatially rendered so that you can think about it so I have a team of students from the ANU Tech Launcher that are working on this, um, and they're, if this is you know this is as far as I've gotten so far. So we have for each of the the 20 points that we have a sensor, we have a point cloud that gets color coded by um, not a point cloud, a uh, like a particle cloud, it gets color coded by temperature, and that can change over time. So you'll be able to look at your 3D model and see the the flow of temperature, and we'll be able to distort deform the um, the point cloud by by the wind patterns. The the trees for all of the trees will be able to change the trees. Um, I got a list here. The the tree color can set height and growth data for instrumented trees, as well as for every tree we can measure the height and volume and foliage density from the UAV data. Um, we can scale the ground to match moisture and temperature, and then because there are these ground-based laser things, you can have the user fly to a certain spot like where the dwell has been and then they'll be able to look around inside a much higher less resolution model. And I think, you know, this is really designed as a demo project just to start thinking about like what do we do with all this data and is this meaningful, how does this help us think about it better. But, you know, I think 20 years from now when every, every research site in the US or in, in Australia is getting this density of data all the time, we're going to need something like this in order to help us um, to visualize it. All right, so final slide. What we do in the next 1,500 years is going to have a critical impact on the Earth and its inhabitants for a long time. And this one was not spelled right. Scaling environmental monitoring to the precision that's required for meeting these challenges is in large part an engineering and computer science problem. And how we, how we tackle that problem and how we help optimize the transfer of research from what you guys do to real world applications really can have a major impact on how well we address these challenges. And you know, more and more what I come up against in my work is like, oh, I need to hire another computer scientist to solve this problem, not I need another biologist because you know, the technology is almost there. Like so much of this stuff has just appeared and it's almost usable, 
but but the hardware needs to be you know cleaned up a little and the software needs to be written to turn all that measurements into actual data and um, so lots of people thank but I assume it's getting late enough. All right, thanks for your time. Cool. Thank you.